Hi, this is Vilma Ben. Um, I'm going to come back and complete where I left off because I got a little uh, tense because a lot of things has been happening to me that's unfair, and I do apologize for that. I'm going to go ahead and go back to the $64,000 question, what is consciousness, um, and where I left off. As noted in Chapter 1, we were speaking about John Watson, the father of modern behaviorism, insisted that only observable measurable behavior was a proper province of psychology. I disagree because sometimes what we see are not what is really happening. It is okay to observe behavior, but do not observe behavior and stipulate behavior and critique it as a negative because behavior, in order for it to be abnormal, a person would have to outburst out of the norm and no one did anything to them. They're just sitting down and all of a sudden they just outburst and pick up something and crash it across them out of head and no one never said anything to them. That is a questionable misbehavior in an environment of someone to just start yelling and screaming and pick up something and crash across somebody's head. So that's that behavior we're not we do not have a chance to observe it. It just happened out of the out of the norm. It just happened. But if we're observing people and watching people, and, and this is how supervisors are doing, is that they're sitting down and they're looking and they're observing their employees. You know, your employee just got up and went to use the bathroom and just came back. What's the big deal? Was that something that needed to be stared about? Oh, okay, next time. I'm saying, I'll come and ask permission, like first grader. Because that's observable behavior. If I'm getting up 10 o'clock to pee, 11 o'clock to pee, 12 o'clock to pee, 1 o'clock to pee, 2, 3, 4, everything, and I can see, you know, getting the looks. I didn't go snort cocaine. I just went to pee and I came back. So what type of observable behavior that we need to do when you hired somebody and they got a reference and you did a background check, they cleared, everything came back okay. You put them in training, they pass. The trainers say they're perfectly fine. They pass the basic standard tests. We're able to use the phone and we're able to make these calls and get the doctor's fees in. So now we're got the experience, the stairs from the supervisor all day, like you did something wrong. So that's that's an observable behavior. Oh, well, we need to do a 90 day, a 90 day observable. Um, we need to evaluate you for 90 days. But we got somebody over there talking on the phone with the earpiece on the ear, like a Bluetooth, and typing <laughs> a Bluetooth. Nobody well, says nothing into them. So when we observe behavior, one may question who are being observed. That's the question. And why? What did they do? Is it something similar to why eight black boys are sitting in the cafeteria eating lunch? You see, these are the people that were Beverly Tatum. Now that's good. These type of people do not need to be in supervision or leading anyone. Because what are you what are you what are you you know what are you observing? So what we have here, measurable behavior. Why are we measuring behavior? We're in the workplace. We're not in a clown circle. We're not in the circus where the clowns jump up and down. We're in the workplace. Everybody is on the phone. You're supposed to observe the computer and watch everything the employees are typing. We have them all broken down into different units. We, we see she logged in at 9 o'clock, but she should have logged in five minutes early. She logged in at 9 o'clock, went and got coffee just like everybody else. That's what Bama did. 
came back, sat down just like everybody else. But everybody's observing it. Oh, I, oh, I can't go get coffee like everybody else. Logged in. We rush to get coffee. We rush to go pee. And we go get coffee. And her can come back and sit the desk. So everybody is doing the same thing. But only one person is being observed. And now we're being biased. Now we're aggressive and biased. But we measure that behavior. How many months? How many days? What are your statistics? What did you come up with? We followed you home. I saw the blonde lady behind me on the way home. What did she follow me home for? She never followed me home before. Oh, she's tracking me to see if I go to the strip club after work. Maybe I have another job. Because she's wearing too many diamonds on her fingers. Why are we observing the unimportant? What's so important? You know, you get your work done, you made your quota, you got your raises. It's still scary. So, was that the proper province of psychology? is to be overzealous and to be one-sided and to pick on certain ones and let everybody else who are the alligators, bears, the tigers, and the jaguars, and the snakes, and the alligators do what they want to do. But the innocent lamb over there, we need to keep an eye on them because they read too much, they read, uh, too much Bible during lunch break. Or they sit by themselves too much, they don't have any friends. So there must be something's wrong with them. Why don't they have any friends? Oh, because we can't sell ourselves to low down dirty people. Oh, well maybe because we need to do all sorts of dirty things and to be a valedictorian and then we can get everybody to like us. Oh, maybe because hmm, I didn't bring any donuts all week. I didn't feed everybody. I don't know why I don't have any friends. It's not important to me. What did I need them for? Do I go out and party to the club? We need a party in the club. Oh, I need a friend to be around my house so my boyfriend can look at her and she can glaze nigga, do Google eyes. And then I'm going to go to the bathroom. That's what I need friends for. I don't know what I need friends for. What do I need friends for? What would we do? Oh, I tell you what. Let's start a sewing class. We can make friends and we can start a sewing class. We can do a cooking. We can, you bring, you show me how to make what I don't know how to make and you know let's let's do that and and what else um I don't have any children so what am I gonna do when you bring your kids over you want me to babysit what do I need friends for oh I need an employment reference so when you when they call you say oh she's never but a whore Bloop, hang on the phone I don't know what you're going to say to them. I'm going to use professional references because I know that you know me from a professional level because I'm looking for a professional job. I'm not looking for a job where entry level where I need to be on the subjection all of the time. But what what is it that I need friends for? So that my boyfriend could see that I have a lot of friends. Am I supposed to get married? I need friends for a wedding. Well, no, this is not a diamond ring. It is not a diamond ring. It is a birthstone. Okay, it is my ex-husband's birthstone. And it has crushed white stones on the outside. But it's 
looks like a diamond ring. See, it's pink. So when I wear something like this, I make everybody jealous, right? What about my watch that has diamond in it? Diamonds in it. Is that going to help me keep friends? They hate me because I have something that they don't have. It's clear logic. What do I need friends for? I need you to pay my bills. I need you to drive me, get my ride to work. I need you to do my hair. I need you to be my flunky. So these are these are different scenarios I'm giving you. What do I need friends for? I used to have a lot of friends growing up as a kid, but everybody used to get mad and say, don't play with her. But I I I I know who I am. It is 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 very good to have friends. I love people. I would love to have women friends, but why are these women behaving like ten year olds and their mothers? I need women friends who are mature and who doesn't act like a ten year old on blast, hiding the truth covert behavior uh, different things they're doing in the background I want to make sure that my friends or when they come to my house they're not going to steal anything off my dresser when I turn my back or they're not going to steal my husband or from me I need you know what do I need friends for so I don't know it doesn't make any sense to me I don't know what I need friends for I don't know they have never amounted to anything but a lot of problems. Jealous. I had to do, drive them everywhere. And then when they get where we're going, and now everybody they brought with them or friends, and they leave me sitting by myself, and I'm looking stupid at the club. I don't know. I really don't know. But these are behaviors that I just measure. What do I need friends for? What are they doing for me? Are they paying my mortgage? I'm here by myself. My boyfriend, I begged him to go back home. I need my space for a while. I got to study. I got to get back into me. You know, let me know. I'll let you know when, you know, when I want to see you. Because the way our life is now, you know, everybody got a, something going on anyway when they're not around me. So I really don't worry about it anymore. So, but I need to have my space because I'm, I'm very miserable right now because things are not working out for us. Should I say that on a video? I'm saying it because I want people to know who I am and not to think I should be this to please you. Once you know who I am and what I'm all about and what makes me happy, is you know, take me to a playwright. Take me to see dancers like African dancers, Irish dancers. Take me to a playwright. Take me to a really nice restaurant dinner. And then, you know, after we leave there, we're gonna go and, and have a dance at a nice jazz club. Maybe sit down and see a concert or something. And then we come back home and then we cuddle, watch a movie, and then we fall in love all over again, go to sleep and wake up in the morning. I, I'm just a person that, it doesn't take a lot of money to make me happy. I'm not saying I'm cheap, but it doesn't because I'm not, you know, I live at the means that I think that I can afford, but I'm not the type of person you got to spend $10,000 on me in five months in order for you to be my man. You know, if you feel like I'm worth a gift or, or something, like I can't wear anything, I can't wear anything around my neck because if I could, I would, you know, I would have a cross on. It just, you know, it aggravates me. I don't like wearing anything around my, my neck. I like like little earrings, you know, studs and small, nice gold earrings. I don't have any piercing. I don't have a lot of tattoos. I have one tattoo. So my behavior is basically I want to stay moderate, but you know, I want to be able to say, okay, if I meet somebody 
that is hyper and and they're very enthusiastic and they're adventurous and they're wild and they're laugh make me happy and they're laughing and a lot of joy now i need to catch up <laughs> because i like calm like a nice calm quiet calm ocean calm but when you know when things get crazy and wild i can hang in there but i don't like it all the time i mean it can be you know so once we know the behavior of our friends then we know that we can fit in with them and not have a problem keeping that friend because we don't want to bring in a calm person into a turbulent storm because many people are able to live within them all the time 24 hours a day The following year, Watson was elected president of the American Psychological Association, which further cemented these ideas in the minds of many psychologists. Because the time seems to have come when psychology must dis discard all references to consciousness. And that's on page 163. And, and, and what, may, what time? What time came around? What era was it that seems to have come when psychology must dis discard all references to consciousness because now we're dealing with mental illness we're dealing with poor behavior we're dealing with adhd we're dealing with manic depressant schizo um paranoid schizophrenia we're dealing with anti-social personality we're dealing with um bipolar um manic depressant we're dealing with people who are on the borderline and because but the main reason reasons that we have these type of problems in the normal world where people are not recognizing their own behavior because everyone has a story Every, everyone just has a disposition and but sometimes they are in denial of being in that disposition because we're supposed to be able to see other people better than they can see themselves but when we see them that way let's not play psychiatrist on everybody everybody wants to be a psychiatrist everyone everyone thinks that they know the, the, that person better than they know themselves and they want to tag along and turn them out to be crazy and to be this and to be that and to that but if your behavior it is a replica of mental illness and you're unable to identify with it yourself, then now you're going to have people withdrawn from you. They're not going to want to be around you anymore. And sometimes when people don't want to be around you anymore, it's because you, you're not a follower. It might not be mental illness. It may not be that they can't direct you and, and instruct you to do things the way they want you. You're not you're not um, marketable as far as they're concerned. You're, you're not a follower. You're, to them, you're not a leader. To you, you are, but to them, you're not a leader. They want somebody else over here that's a leader. And then you, when you trust their the decision, now you've got someone that's a leader and the team failed or your team lost. But I, I, I knew if I had that that team you would have done better because you know you but then who knows because we are all there in the same place but if i am a person with personality adjustment disorder that once you make me angry i yell and scream and if you keep doing it i want to fight you but i need to be in control of that so what i need to do is walk away and let you win I say, but then I won too because I didn't I didn't respond. But why do I have to always not respond? Why is it that you always got to be the one to flap at the mouth and have your way, but I can't respond? When is it that I can have my way? These are good questions that we can ask ourselves because it's the meaning of being consciousness of who you are and what you want out of life. You want to be respected just the same as everyone else because you're not disrespecting anyone, but why you don't fit in? 
So if you don't fit in, you got to keep asking yourself, why, 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 and proving to people that you're better, that still yet are to see you as a god, a, a, a guardian angel or an angelic being. But everyone thinks you're a devil because as soon as they do something to you, somebody dies. The meaning of consciousness. The word consciousness has several meanings. Let's have a look at a few of them. Consciousness is sensory awareness. One meaning of consciousness is sensory awareness of the environment. You, you're fully aware of sensory. You know, you sense the environment is gonna, it's where I wanna be right now. I moved here. I, I, I think this is a nice place. But then a week later, there was somebody shooting at you and trying to kill you when you're getting out of your car to walk into your home. But you didn't pick it up. The sense of vision permits us to be conscious of or to see the sun gleaming in the snow on the rooftops. Because we see this, the snow glooming at the, in the sun on the rooftops as the, the snow is melting because there's still some snow left there. So you're conscious of what you're seeing. The sense of hearing allows us to be conscious of or to hear a concert. We are more conscious of or have greater awareness of those things to which we pay attention. And many things are going on nearby and in the world at large, yet you are conscious of or focusing on the words on this page. So because you're conscious of reading, because I'm conscious of reading this paragraph, the television behind me is not disturbing me. I, I, I turned the volume down and I hope that the volume is not going to be too loud when I replay the tape. So these are things that I'm conscious of right now. We are more conscious of or have greater awareness of those things to which we pay attention. Many things are going on nearby, as I said, in the world at large, yet you are conscious of, or focusing on the words on this page. Perhaps you are, perhaps you're not. Consciousness as direct inner awareness. Consciousness as direct inner awareness. Conscious of how I speak, that the words that's flowing out of my mouth are understood. Consciousness as direct inner awareness close your eyes imagine spilling a can of bright red paint across a black tabletop watch it spread across the black shiny surface then spill onto the floor although this image may be vivid you did not see it literally your eyes and no your eyes and no other sensory organs were involved you are conscious of the image through direct inner awareness. And so that's what we call direct inner awareness is when someone say, take 15 minutes break. Imagine that you're on the beach with a pina colada and, and, and you see a nice sailboat go by and everyone, the kids are running around playing, you know, a beach, playing with a beach ball. And you're just in a very nice, beautiful, sunny day and you're in a, Beautiful island of Tahiti. So that's a direct inner awareness of where you want to be, but you're not there. You're just imagining that you're there. We are conscious of or have direct inner awareness, inner awareness of thoughts, images, emotions, and memories. And, and it's good to, you know, oh, you remember when we were kids and we used to play hide and seek and, and, and we used to pick up bottles and go to the store and, and we didn't have any money, but we brought those bottles, we found them, we cleaned, this, we cleaned the city up. We had a basket full of bottles and we, we used to get two cents for each bottle. We all end up with $10 after all the, the bottles were counted up. And, and we came home and, and we had ice cream, cookies, and potato chips. You remember that? And then someone would say, oh, I forget the past. Oh, I don't wanna talk about that, right? So what they've done is they've taken away your inner direct awareness 
of what you remember happened in the past. It was a memory. And it still is set into your long-term memory because you're now 50 or something years old and now we're talking about remember when we were kids. And so some people do not want to dread on the past. We are conscious of or know of the presence of all these cognitive processes without using our scenes as a thoughts, our way of thinking. Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, differentiated thoughts and feelings of which we are conscious or aware from those which are pre-conscious and unconscious. And it's given a direction C figure 4.1. Pre-conscious material is not currently in awareness, but is readily avail available. As you answer the following questions, you will summon pre-conscious information. What did you eat for dinner yesterday? What about, what, about what time did you wake up this morning? What's happening outside the window or down the hall right now? Why is somebody repeating everything I'm saying outside? It sounds like my voice is echoing, like somebody's repeating everything. Uh, what's your phone number? Uh, we can make these pre-conscious bits of information conscious simply by directing our inner awareness or attention to them. So these are our consciousness. The conscious level, the pre-conscious level is a midpoint, and the unconscious level is, is always in the back. So I'm just going to see if it can show up. Because I have to write Okay, there we go. So, side on. The consciousness is up here. This is where your thoughts are. This is your forehead, and it's where thinking a lot and your brain always active is in the front of your head, the frontal lobe of your head. It is why if someone shoot you in the back of the head, many people who are shot in the back of the head, they do not die, but they end up paraplegic. Not all the time, but because it's the unconsciousness. When they're shot somewhere in the front of the head, where they're always conscious, it's a possibility that these people, they might live, and, and, and depending on where the bullet where the bullet will lodge in the head. So we have perceptions, thoughts. This is our con the conscious level, perceptions and thoughts. It's in the frontal lobe. In midstream, like across here, your memories and stored knowledge is right here. In the back, your moral urges, okay, like you want to do dirty things, nasty, dirty things, shameful experiences, memories of something that happened and embarrassed you, selfish needs, fears, unacceptable sexual desires, violent motives, irrational wishes, all this is in the back of the head. That's your unconscious level. It's always in the back. And across the top is your pre-conscious level, memories and stored knowledge. It's where all the data is. It's, it's where your intelligence level is. It's right up here at the top of the head. It's where where the headphones are, that's your pre-conscious, the pre-conscious level are memories from years ago that's stored in their long-term memories. It's like a database, like a CPU unit, and the stored knowledge, okay? That's where it's up here, always here. That's the part of your brain. But back here is where all the garbage is, the dirt, the, the, the scorn, the lies, the cheats, and all the nasty stuff is back here. And in the front, is where we have to think and we have to remember it's frontal lobe is close it is closer to the pre-conscious level and right here is a frontal lobe it's when we take when we're taking a test an exam everything is right i know i know the answer i studied but you always say always say because the information that you're looking for is up here no one ever goes To think back here. So this is where all the garbage is, is back here. All the negative 
all the emotions, the fears, the gossiping, the negative is back here. But every time you need to think, you know, you're like, And everything that's stored is in the top of your head. Okay, so that's where all the, the data is, is kept right here. The levels of consciousness according to Sigmund Freud, according to Freud, many memories, impulses, like when we have uh, an impulse, um, is that we buy something, we see something, oh, I remember, I want this, I want this, and the kids, oh, mommy, 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 I want this, I want this, that's impulses. And feelings exist below the level of conscious awareness because we impulsive. Impulsive person can be impulsive and, and bothersome, bothersome to others because they're impulsive. Instant, it's like we see something in an instant, it's from the, the, the stores, the way they set up the stock things where they, this is not selling. So we're going to put it in the front of the store and we're going to put it on sale. So that's instant shopping. It's where they put things for you to see it, like this big old cakes with the icing on it. We're not selling any cake. So we got a new cake today, a strawberry. We want to give you five pounds today. So we're going to put that big beautiful yellow angel cake right in the front when you walk in the store you're going to see it and then you're going to grab it okay you're buying it on instant and it's on impulse okay according to fruit to sigmund freud still other mental events are unconscious or unavailable to awareness under most circumstances. And they light this up like an inner dark. Okay. Freud believed that certain memories were painful and certain impulses, which are primarily sexual and aggressive impulses, were unacceptable. Therefore, we would place them out of awareness or repress them to escape the feelings of anxiety, guilt, and shame. So repressing, when someone, when we have a repressive government, um, they're not really concerned about the people who are poor as much as they are concerned about the people who are rich because the people who are poor does not provide the capital and the money to create jobs or to build a new building or to help a cause to donate to another country. So there is what they call a safety net or set in place for the poor. We have a thing we call welfare. But it's only supposed to be temporarily, but sometimes we are conditioned to accept it for so long as people who are living in poverty or who may be uneducated and they can't make a living other than to go out and do a few days work because they don't have the skills to get hired in a corporate office or something where they're surviving of low income and but sometimes you know they're working they're getting paid cash and they're not paying their taxes and they're not reporting so this is what we call people who are thinking that because i go out and i work and i do days work and i get paid cash $50 a day and sometimes $75 a day that I spend that money every day because I need my bus fare. I need to buy uh, uh, food for my children. I'm not married. And I spend, I get 75 a day, maybe cleaning houses or washing windows. But my gas for the rest of the week, that'll come out of that 75 a day. So we get um, 375, 75 and 75 is one uh 150 and then two more days is 300 and then that last day is 75 so you're making 375 per week so if you're making 375 per week we have 1200 and we have the 300 so that's um 1500 per month so you're able to to spend as long as you get that job tomorrow that's paying you cash 
you you have confidence in spending, but what if you come to work tomorrow and there's no day's work? But I have a friend who needs somebody to, to help her out. Why don't you give her a call? Now you gotta call her and sell yourself. But you need your your uh, boss that you work with, your client to, you know, could you please put a word in for me so when I call, you know, it would be easier for me to get the work. You know, so you have a right to, you have a right to, um, to request a, a reference, a letter of reference. Could you please call her and give me a good reference and let her know how well I work so that when I get there, it would be easier for me to get the job. And then, oh, I'll have something for you. Give me a call back in about six months because I'm going to be going out of town. We're going to be going to our home. We live in Canada or we live, we're going to go back to New York. We'll be back down to Florida in six months. Something like that. So these are, these are, when you live, when, when, when you're living in a way where you, you, you're not sure uh, what tomorrow might bring. We're living in guilt is when we did something to somebody and we're living in the house with them, cheated on them, living in the house with them. That's guilt. Some people can live with guilt. They keep doing it. They're guilty. So now they're not able to communicate with the person because they're so guilty about something that they did terribly wrong to them or they're still doing things to them terribly wrong and and they're not admitting it and you don't know it but they can't communicate they have to turn they can't look it in the eye and things like that shame is when you're poor you don't have any clothes you don't have a car you're barely getting by you wear flip-flops and you have on a dress the same dress every day and you're ashamed because every day people got to see you in the same dress the same shoes but then Having a feeling of shameless means that you do not have faith, but what you need to do is to have more confidence and, and, and to also ignore and suppress the feeling of not being feeling worthy. So you just put it in the back of your mind. You don't worry about it. You, you want to be able to buy a few more pieces of clothing. Just have faith. You know, just maybe you ought to go shopping because I did it once when... I went through unemployment and I didn't want my husband to spend a lot of money and whatever. I, I wanted to go for a job interview and I went through this um, training for interviews and there were places that we were sent to go and buy clothes on consignment and then I realized that it was a nice, a lot of nice things in there, designer clothes in there and then I referred some friends to go there and shop too. Some bodily processes are non-conscious incapable of being experienced either through sensory awareness or direct inner awareness so um when you're non-conscious is that you everybody um not everyone has a maid and some people were raised up with maids so then they're, they're they're non conscious about cleaning after themselves when they eat food or something they leave their plate on the coffee table or they when, when they're in the kitchen or something um they make a mess and drop things and they don't pick up after themselves or they use the bathroom they don't flush things like that so that's when we have non-conscious because we're used to someone doing things for us we're not used to doing anything for ourselves the growing of hair and the carrying of oxygen in the blood or non-conscious. And that's what we call involuntary. It's because we don't have to do anything because the hair is going to grow on its own and your heart is going to beat and oxygen is going to... Um, oxygen is carried through our blood through the, um, through the oxygen we breathe and we inhale and exhale. And so the oxygen is coming in and it goes right through your bloodstreams. And the bloodstream also has blood, blood going through it, but it must not have clots. And so it's oxygenated blood. And then it's deoxygenated is when we blow it back out and then we breathe and we're breathing all day. You're breathing normal. 
as a medical assistant, um, I had to count the amount of in, uh, aspiration breaths that a person had taken within a time frame and record it down. And that's what we call this to, um, you're not conscious of it and take blood pressure and things like that. We can see that our hair has grown, but have no sense receptors that provide sensations related to the process. So we don't feel the hair growing. It's just that when we wash our hair and comb it and we braid it, we find that like my hair is packed now, but if I stand it up, say this is the length of my hair, but I would have to put something in it to straighten it to see the length. But I cut it again. My hair should my hair should be as long as it is. I cut it again, see? See the length? Because it's packed down. It's packed down and you know it's um I cut it again. My hair at one one time reached the area of my breast and all the way in my back right here. I had hair that long before. But I don't like long hair. I I, I the older I, I, I am, I grow in my age, I don't like long hair at all. It's easy to just wash it and and just comb it. So we can feel the need to breathe, but we cannot directly experience the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. Therefore, we can see that our hair has grown, like I just showed you, but have no sense receptors that provide sensations related to the process. You'd have to see it by combing it and looking at it, but we can't feel it growing. We can feel the need to breathe, but we cannot directly experience the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. So that's CO2. Consciousness as personal unity, the sense of self. To the newborn the world must seem a confusing disarray of sensory inputs, but gradually we begin to sort things out and better organize our perceptions. We also learn to differentiate us from that which is not us. We develop a sense of being persons, individuals, there is a totality to our impressions, thoughts, and feelings that comprise, comprises our conscious, conscious existence, our continuing sense of self in a changing world. In this use of the word, consciousness is self. Cognitive psychologists view a person's consciousness as an important determinant of the person's behavior. So, um, Like I explained in the video before this one, in order to be conscious, I must be able to control myself. I must be able to understand that um, I must be conscious of having control of my actions because the consequences, the consequences of my own actions are the result of my destination. Therefore, I must control myself, thus someone else may act a fool. Because the consequences of my own actions are the results of my destination. Okay, so I don't want to end up someplace where I regret what I did. So I must stay away from there stay away from that person um or, or or just avoid the problem don't say anything and walk the other way but sometimes people can't do that sometimes people are followed and and cursed into a turnaround and and so that's what we call um consciousness as a personal unity it's a sense of self, of who you truly are within your own being. Consciousness as the waking state. The least controversial meaning of the word consciousness describes the normal waking state as opposed. For example, to sleep. You know, we need sleep. We ought to get at least eight hours of sleep. Sometimes we get eight hours of still sleeping. 
But if you know, if you're studying and you're in college and you have a paper due and you have to work a job plus maybe your job is from three eleven three three PM to eleven and you work from eight to two. And you really don't have a chance to go home and shower, so you have to bring a change of clothes and just freshen up in the restroom before you start your job from three to eleven. But you have a paper that your professor told you that morning that's due tomorrow and you need to write at least about 500 words and and then there's something else you might have to do is to um write 500 words and to also you have to ex write some sentences that matches up to the descriptive essay that you have to write or persuasive essay so now you get home it takes about 30 minutes, maybe an hour. Some people have worked very far an hour to drive home. You get home midnight. Now you're hungry, you want to shower, you want to grab a bite. And now you need to write this paper before six in the morning because you have a job at eight. And I remember being in a position like that. I had to work from nine to four, nine, nine to five. And I get home. 5.30 and, and the, the college I attended was only about 20 minutes away, but I used, I used to get there on time and I was rushing. And then from 10, from 6 to 10, and then I get home and I have a paper, do things like that. So I, you know, you when you really want to educate yourself, you really want it bad, you, you will find the time. You will find the, the, the time to use, utilize the time and manage it well so that you are able to earn a living because you cannot get the funds you need right then when you're first starting out to pay all your bills. So on starting out school, you need to be able to get the funds to cover your bills in order not to work. But if you don't, you're not given the, the same, the amount of funds to cover your bills then you need to work unless you have your parents helping you with your bills. Okay, so the least controversial meaning of the word consciousness describes the normal waking state as opposed, for example, to sleep. From this perspective, sleep, meditation, the hypnotic trance, and the disordered perceptions that can accompany use of consciousness, altering drugs are considered altered states of consciousness. So we sleepy, so we take some um, Dramamine or something to, to help us go to sleep. Now, for the remainder of this chapter, we shall explore various states of consciousness and the agents that bring them about. These states and agents include sleep and dreams, a number of drugs, meditation, biofeedback, and hypnosis. And sleep and dreams, sleep has always been a fascinating topic after all, we spend about one third of our adult lives sleeping. Most of us complain when we do not sleep at least six hours or so, but some people sleep for an hour or less a day and lead otherwise healthy and normal lives. And that's exactly what I was just saying to you, that if you have um, a need to educate yourself so that you can better your life and earn enough money to make an honest living, you need to go to school and you need to work because no one's going to pay for your education right away when you first start. You you might be able to qualify for Pell Grants and maybe loans, but you're not going to get that extra money you need. You're not going to get a lot of money in the beginning. You have to work your way up to it through college. Why do we sleep? Why do we dream? Why do some of us have trouble getting to sleep? And what can we do about it? We don't have all the answers to these questions, but we have learned a great deal. You know, we need sleep in order to leave normal lives. But but if we sacrifice to do something better, to better ourselves, to, to better our lives, we're going to lose sleep. We have to give in order to receive. The stages of sleep. When I was an undergraduate psychology student, I first heard that psychologists studied sleep by connecting people to the electro encephalograph, EEG, 
a device that measures the electrical activity of the brain. I had a gruesome image of people somehow being plugged into the EEG. I had a gruesome image of people somehow being plugged into the EEG. Not so. Electrodes are simply attached to the scalp or other areas with tape or paste. Later, once the brain activity under study has been duly recorded, they are simply removed. A bit of soap and water, and you're as good as new. The EEG provides psychologists with some interesting scrawls that show the frequency and strength of the electric currents of the brain. Okay, so they have, um, this is what surgeons, when surgeons operate on patients, they're using an EEG so that they can know when you might have trouble that might cause them to have, like a patient sometimes experience cardiac arrest during surgery. So they need to have that EEG going so they can measure the activity of your brain. And um, let's see, this is a REM, okay, this is a REM cycles. And, and it helps them know that something is wrong with the patient as the patient is under anesthesia at the time. The waking state, stage one sleep, stage two sleep, stage three sleep, stage four sleep, rapid eye movement. And this is what they use when you are under anesthesia because you sleep. A trip from a high point to a low point and back is called a cycle. During the deepest stage of sleep or stage four sleep, only about one to three of these cycles occur each second. So the printouts in figure 4.2 show what happens over a period of 15 seconds or so. During stage four, during stage four sleep, the brain emits slow but strong delta waves. And that's what we see right here. That's four, that's stage three. That's three, that's two and one. You first start going to sleep. You first put under anesthesia or when you first start to sleep. And then stage four, it, it, it's like a more, you're, you have rapid eye movement and then you wake up at stage five. That's a REM sleep. And that's what we call, where I was in the sleep of REM and I woke up and I thought I saw someone standing over my bed. And, 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 and I, was, I was just waking up and when I looked, they were gone. So that's a REM stage. It's that you were going into another dream, but you woke up, you you know, you were awakened by something. You woke up before that dream began and you thought you saw something, but it wasn't uh, something like in, in flesh and blood. It was that you saw an image or you saw a figure and it was because you were waking up and you thought you saw something, you woke up. During stage four sleep, the brain emits slow but strong delta waves. Delta waves reach relatively great height or aptitude or amplitude, amplitude, when compared with other brain waves. Their amplitude reflects their strength. The strength or energy of brain waves is expressed in the electric unit volts. In figure 4-2, it shows five stages of sleep. Four stages of non-rapid eye movement, which are NREM sleep, and one stage of rapid eye movement REM sleep. When we close our eyes and begin to relax before going to sleep, our brains emit many alpha waves. The alpha waves are low amplitude brain waves of about 8 to 12 cycles per second. Alpha waves are low amplitude brain waves of about 8 to 12 cycles per second. Through biofeedback training discussed later in the chapter, people have been taught to relax by purposefully emitting alpha waves. As we enter stage one sleep, our brain waves slow down from the alpha rhythm and enter a pattern of theta waves or theta waves. Theta waves have a frequency of four to six cycles per second and are accompanied by slow rolling eye movements, the transition from alpha waves to theta waves may be accompanied by a hypnagogic state, 
a hypnagogic state during which we may experience brief hallucinatory dreamlike images that resemble vivid photographs. And that was what I was just mentioning just a moment ago. Um, Sometimes, I don't know, sometimes you see, you know, people believe that they need to examine somebody before they marry them or need to make sure that that they are fully intact up here, that their schools are tightened before they marry them. So they secretly are watching you and doing all sorts of PBR images on you and testing you and watching you and using body scans on you. I think these kind of people are that seriously something is wrong with them. Because the only time a person would need to have this type of interpretation done on them is if this person suffered with a brain damage, they fell and hit the head or something, and they went and had a concussion. Then you need to monitor them because that person could die in about, I think, an hour later after falling on the head and having a concussion, they can die and that person could die an hour later. So that's why they need to, if you fall on your head, you need to immediately go to the hospital if you have a head injury. If you accidentally fall in or someone hit you in your head, you need to immediately go to the hospital because they may have hit you someplace where it can cause a blood clot in your head and it would explode and you'd die. And so that, that's the only reason I think that anyone need to have their brains that interpreted for a whole year or read for a whole year. Um, why do we need to read somebody's brain for a whole year? It's because we're still in data. Uh, but what's wrong with your brain? Why don't we put the interpreter, the, the, the uh, brain wavelength on your head? Because you obviously don't know what's wrong with you because you're putting it on somebody else. You know, why don't we test it on you to see why your brain is so narrow and you do not understand anything and that you're so dunce and you can't grow, you know, so, but we want to steal somebody else's information to make it easy for ourselves because what's wrong with our heads? You know, what's wrong with your head that you got to put a, a, a magnetic electro wave, the same thing that goes on in a microwave on somebody's brain and, 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 and make it make your your brain uh, respond to some kind of fibrillators so that you can read their minds and see what they're, if they're crazy or not. You know what kind of psychologist do does these things or psychiatrist? You know when a person has never done anything before in their, in their life. I don't. Know. I, I really don't understand it. It just don't make sense to me. After 30 to 40 minutes of stage one sleep, we undergo a rather sleep descent until sleep stages two, three, and four. So sleep stages two, three, and four, two, three, and four, we have a REM stage chart right here in the book. It's right there. It's a REM stage chart. Um, stage one is, let's go up to the top of here. And stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Okay, that's the hours of sleep. The REM stage is when we are in a dream and we keep going in and out of the dream, a new dream, but we never wake up in and out of the dream. We go to another dream, another dream, go on, and keep going. And now we're, now we're um, waking up. That's what it says. Now we're waking up. So, but sometimes we dream, we don't even know we had a dream. Sometimes I wake up like, I'm angry, like, I had a good dream. I met a guy and he was so nice. Wow, that was a dream. And then one time I was dreaming and I woke up and I said, oh my goodness, thank God it was a dream. Because I dreamed that I was in, in a lot of trouble and I got in some trouble or something. And I was getting ready to to be to sit in court and everything about it. So it's like I'm so happy it was a dream. Thank you, God. It's a dream. 
So these images may be somehow linked to creativity. Stage one sleep is the lightest stage of sleep. If we are awakened from stage one sleep, we may feel that we have not slept at all and even deprived. We're going to feel like we've been deprived of our sleep. And get, some people don't wake them up. You might get shot. <laughs> they just get crazy. After 30 to 40 minutes of stage one sleep, we undergo a rather steep descent into sleep stages, two, three, and four. Stage four is the deepest stage of sleep from which it is most difficult to be awakened. During stage two, sleep spindles appear. And that's like where I was showing you the, the up and down, descending, 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 descending. Um, these are rather short bursts of rapid brain waves of a frequency of 13 to 16 cycles per second. During stages three and four, we produce the slower delta waves. After perhaps half an hour of steep sleep, stage four sleep, we begin a relatively rapid journey back upward through the stages until we enter REM sleep. REM sleep derives its name from the rapid eye movements observable beneath our closed lids that characterizes this stage. During REM sleep, we produce relatively rapid, low amplitude brain waves that resemble those of light stage one sleep. REM sleep is also called paradoxical sleep. This is because the EEG patterns observed during REM sleep suggest a level of arousal similar to that of the waking state. However, we are difficult to awaken during REM sleep. If we are awakened during REM sleep, we report that we have been dreaming 80% of the time. We also, ah, oh, you woke me up from a dream, a good dream, right? Okay. We also dream during in REM sleep, but less frequently. We report dreaming only about 20% of the time when awakened during in REM sleep. And again, in REM sleep is non-rapid eye movement. As you can see from figure 4.3, we tend to undergo five trips through the different stages of sleep each night. These trips include about five periods of REM sleep. Our first journey through stage four sleep is usually longest. Sleep tends to become lighter as the night wears on. Our periods of REM sleep tend become longer and toward the early morning toward morning our last period of REM sleep may last upwards of half an hour let's see if how much I have here I am going to do one more page and come back because I have quite a bit of pages here To finish the psychology book has a very large chapter um, in fact it's speaking about altering consciousness through drugs where people drink and people enjoy their lives with friends having dinner with wine as altering you altering your um, consciousness through drugs and alcohol we need medication to make us happy, pep pills, things like that. Okay, I'm going to end on functions of sleep. Now that we have some idea of what sleep is like, let us examine the issue of why we sleep. Um, in the photo, most researchers agree that sleep helps rejuvenate a tired body. There is less agreement concerning possible psychological functions of sleep and dreams. And so we have a picture of a beautiful baby trying to get some sleep. It's right there. But the baby is like, you know, playing around with their head and like trying to trying to go to sleep. But they're not sleeping yet. But you know the mom is watching the baby. She knows when the child is getting sleepy because their head gets bobbing and something like that and they start crying and then when they're crying their eyes are 
So now the mom knows the baby is going to be sleeping in a few minutes. Don't worry about the baby. You won't hear her crying in a while. It's going to be sleep. Functions of sleep. One outdated theory of the reasons for sleep suggested that sleep allowed the brain to rest and recuperate from the stresses of working all day. But the EEG has shown that the brain is active all night long, moreover, at least during REM sleep. The brain waves are quite similar to those of light sleep and awakened state, so the power isn't switched off at night. Okay, so again, the brain waves are quite similar to those of light sleep and the waking state, so the power isn't switched off at night when they're doing brain wave testing on people. But what of, but what of sleep and the rest of the body? You know, what of the sleep and the rest of the body? Most researchers would not contest the view that sleep helps rejuvenate a tired body, according to Levitt in 1981. Um, most of us have had the experience of going without sleep for a night and feeling wrecked the following day. Perhaps the following evening, we went to bed early to get our sleep back. Research also suggests that increased physical exertion leads to a greater proportion of time spent in in REM sleep, according to Walker and others, 1978. Hartman in 1973 suggests that many proteins are synthesized during in REM sleep. Again, in REM sleep, it's non-rapid eye movement. So Hartman in 1973 suggests that many proteins are synthesized during the um, non-rapid eye movement sleep room and that these protein, proteins may be linked to the restorative effects of sleep. However, no one has yet discovered a relationship between sleep and the restoration of specific chemical substances. No one has yet discovered a relationship between sleep and the restoration of specific chemical substances. Let us continue our study of the functions of sleep by turning to research concerning long versus short sleepers and the effects of sleep deprivation. Long versus short sleepers, according to Ernest Hartman, 1973, of Tufts University compared people who slept nine hours or more a night as long sleepers with people who slept six hours or less, short sleepers. You ever want to sleep on the weekend and you worked hard and you went to school and then you're waking up, you better get up and clean up. That is when you're really trying to sleep. Ah, you know, you want to sleep and you got to get up and clean up. He found that short sleepers tend to be more happy-go-lucky. They spent less time sleepers. They spent less time ruminating and were energetic, active, and relatively self-satisfied. The long sleepers were more concerned about personal achievement and social causes. causes. The long sleepers were more concerned about personal achievement and social causes. They tended to be more creative and thoughtful, but were also more anxious and depressed. Hartman also found that in general, we tend to need more sleep during periods of change and stress, such as a change of jobs, an increase in workload, or an episode of depression. So it may be that sleep helps us recover from the stresses of life. And my friend tells me that all the time. But when I have assignments due, and I'm up sometimes, if I go to sleep, I'm going to procrastinate even longer tomorrow. I might not wake up on time. So when I'm into it, that's when I would rather just go ahead and finish what I'm doing. And then I might have one page or two pages to do. And if I'm really sleepy and I, it's not due until maybe Monday next week, and today tonight is Thursday, or, or uh, now we're um, in Friday early morning, then I know I have the whole weekend to finish it, and I'm going to try to finish it before Sunday. Okay, so Hartman also found that in general, we tend to need more sleep during periods of change and stress, such as change of jobs, an increase in workload, or an episode of depression. So it may be that sleep helps us recover from the stresses of life, and it does. 
Hartman also found that long sleepers spend proportionately more time in REM sleep than do short sleepers. Subtracting the amount of REM sleep experienced by both types of sleepers dramatically closed the gap between them. Perhaps REM sleep is at least partially responsible for the restorative function. That's like when we go to sleep and we're continually going to a new dream and we'll wake up, use the bathroom, and you go, you're able to go right back to sleep. This is 3 o'clock in the morning, and you don't need to get up until uh, 5 o'clock. So, oh, I got a couple more hours. Let me try to get a couple more hours. And then the alarm go off, and it seems like you only slept about 10 minutes. And you remember you had two hours. So that's the type of sleep that they talk about. Now, um, perhaps REM sleep is at least partially responsible for the restorative function. Because now we went to sleep, we woke up and went right back to sleep. Now we've got to wake up and it's like we're tired. So now we have to restore ourselves because now it's time for us to function again. Since much REM sleep is spent in dreaming, it has been speculated that dreams may somehow promote recovery. Sleep deprivation. What will happen to you if you miss sleep for one night? For several nights. If you cut down from, say, your normal seven to 10 hours to just five and a half. Anecdotal and research evidence offers some suggestions. In 1959, disc jockey Peter Tripp remained awake for eight days. Toward the end of this episode, he became so paranoid that he could not be given psychological tests, according to Demet, 1972. However, 17-year-old Randy Gardner remained to wake for 264 consecutive hours, 11 days, and did not show serious psychological disturbance, according to Levitt in 1981. In another antidote, 10 of 11 military cadets who were ordered to engage in strenuous activity for 100 hours developed visual hallucinations and most develop problems in balance and movement. So they're like really um, not able to, that's just like if a person is in, on the sea in a boat for so many days, like a month, and then when they finally um, reach shore, find land, and they're on land, they begin to have visual hallucinations, thinking that they're seeing something that they're not seeing. And most develop problems in balance and movement, and able to, and not able to walk straight, according to Upstad and others in 1978. But as noted by Levin in 1981, these cadets were also deprived of rest and food, not just sleep. According to sleep researcher Will C. Webb, carefully controlled experiments with people who remained sleepless for several consecutive days result in few serious disturbances. Most often, participants show temporary problems in attention, confusion, or misperception, according to Goldman, as in Coleman, but with a G, Coleman, 1982. These cognitive lapses may reflect brief episodes of borderline sleep. What if we were to decide that we wanted to spend a bit more of our lives in the waking state to work, to study, to play, or per chance to daydream? Or would any ill effects attend curtailing our sleep to say five and a half hours a night? Webb followed 15 college men who restricted their sleep to five and a half hours for 60 days. For the first few weeks, they showed an increase in deep sleep but a decrease in REM sleep. But by the end of the first 30 days, they returned to the original level of deep sleep, but REM sleep remained at a below normal level. So the first 30 days, there were 60 days research was gonna be done on participants who had sleep problems. And so um, according to Webb, he followed 15 college men who restricted their sleep to five and a half hours for 60 days. So um, for 60 days, they only slept five and a half hours. 
For the first few weeks, they showed an increase in deep sleep, but a decrease in REM sleep. So that's what the rapid decrease in rapid eye movement. But they slept very well. But by the end of the first 30 days, they returned to the original level of deep, deep sleep. But rapid eye movement sleep remained at a below normal level. But over the 60 days, the men showed little drop off in ability to remember or to compute numbers. So um, the memory was lost. They did show less vigilance on one psychological test as measured in terms of numbers of responses. But Webb suggests that this deficit may have reflected decreased motivation um, to perform well, rather than a falling off of perceptual sharpness. So animals are tested in psychology to see their responses when a bell is ringing, when the master is coming home from work, the dog is jumping up and down on the other side of the fence and happy. But if a stranger approaches that gate, the animal will respond with a bark and a vicious, a vicious behavior will, will follow because I don't smell my master. So I'm going to tear you to pieces if you come in this gate. So it depends on the act. It depends on the normal routine of sleep. If you're raised up as a child and you were, as you can recall, getting, you have, you had to be in bed at 6 PM and you wake up two o'clock in the morning. You can't go back to sleep. Excuse me. <laughs> Getting sleepy. It's time to cut the video off. Um, you can't get back to sleep. But as a child is up now looking at TV and the parents like, what are you doing up? Turn the TV off and go back to sleep. A child can't go back to sleep because you put the child to bed at 6 in the morning, 6 in the evening. But if you put the child to sleep 8 in the night, after they have watched their favorite programs and had family night with, you know, the other siblings and their parents. Now that child might make, wake up four in the morning, five in the morning, just in time for the parents to wake up and get them ready for school. So putting the child to sleep six in the morning, six in the evening, that child is going to wake up two o'clock too early. You're still asleep. So the best time will be put them to bed at eight in the night, no later than nine o'clock, because these children need to be in class, I think now seven o'clock in the morning or 6.30 in the morning. So you want to be able to get up and get them dressed for school. Now, but having to sleep, if I sleep longer than I need to, my, my body is aching. I wake up, my bones, body is aching because I laid down too long in the bed. So. You know, the body tells you when to get up. You know it's time to get up because now you're aching because you're tired and you, you're lethargic and you should lie down a little longer. It is particularly interesting that the men reported falling asleep in class or feeling drowsy during the first week only. After that, they reported less drowsiness than prior to the study. Did the study encourage them to permanently change their lifestyles? No. Despite the lack of ill effects of restricted sleep, all participants returned to their normal seven or eight hours when the study was complete because it's normal. So that concludes um, the states of consciousness parts where I began consciousness, the meaning of consciousness, unconsciousness, repression, suppression, non-consciousness, um, consciousness as a personal unity, the sense of self, consciousness as the waking state, sleep and dreams, the stages of sleep, delta waves, volts, non-rapid eye movement, rapid eye movement, alpha waves, theta waves, uh, hypnagogic state, sleep spindles, and the functions of sleep.
uh, of it being long and short hours you have slept, sleep deprivation, and the reaction of that person that was deprived of sleep. Deprivation of REM sleep. I'm going to start that in the next video. So thank you very much for uh, being with me here, Velma Plan. Thank you, and have a good morning.